Hello again, everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we're moving on to our discussion of the Mino. Uh, and this is part of our sort of series in justifying Plato's theory of forms, which ultimately is rounding out Socrates' overall project. So, like I said at the end of the last lecture, right, Plato believed there's this immortal soul, uh, and before it was embodied, it existed in the same immaterial realm as the forms. And so we already have knowledge. We already have this innate knowledge of the forms within us because our souls have already seen it. And so all we need to do is just recollect that knowledge. And so we're going to start with this theory of recollection in the Mino. Uh, so in the Mino, Socrates and Mino are discussing the meaning of virtue. So it's another dialogue where they're trying to figure out what the essence or definition of a word is, right? So then this time it's about virtue and whether or not it can be taught. But as Socrates is doing his normal back and forth with Mino, right? They're doing the dialectic, doing their method of question and answer. Mino's having a really difficult time and he's sort of getting frustrated and Mino says, how are you going to search for this, Socrates, when you do not have the faintest idea what it is? Which of the things you do not know will you suppose that it is when you are searching for it? And even if you do come across it, how are you going to know that this is the thing you did not know? And Socrates responds, I see what you're getting at, Mino. Do you see what an heuristic argument you're conjuring up, that it's not possible for a man to search for what he knows or for what he does not know? For he would not search for what he knows, for he knows it, and there's no need to search for something like that, nor for what he does not know, for he does not know what he is going to search for. In other words, how are we going to find this stuff? Right? How can we search for these definitions when we don't know what it is, right? The search is sort of fundamentally flawed. Either one of us knows the answer, and so we can't search for it anyway. We already know it. There's no need to search. But since we're both claiming that we don't know, well, if neither of us knows the answer, then we're not going to recognize it if we stumble upon it, right? Nobody knows the standard by which to measure a correct answer. So how are we going to know if we bring up the correct answer? We'll probably just move on right by it. We won't be able to recognize that it's correct. And so Socrates is just wasting his time, Mino says, right? This, this search is really just fundamentally flawed. In neither way can we actually search and have that search result in knowledge. Because either you have the knowledge or you don't, and so you won't recognize it when you see it. Okay, so obviously Socrates needs to respond to this, or he's been wasting his time with all of these conversations about uh, the virtues and their essences. So Socrates says, look, Mino, you claim that if someone knows the answer, then they cannot search for the answer. But Socrates denies this claim, right? You can search for something you know. And now... This makes common, I think this makes common sense, right? Or matches with common sense, right? There are all sorts of things, bits of knowledge I have that sometimes it's really hard for me to access, right? Sometimes it's like, oh, I know I learned that like five years ago. Let me think, let me try and pull that back to the forefront of my mind, right? So it seems like we can search for things we already know. Uh, but Socrates has something a little bit deeper in mind, right? He says, look, we can definitely search for things we already know, because the soul is immortal. And so that soul has knowledge that predates our body. And so if that soul already has knowledge, we should be able to access that knowledge. And so we can search for something we already know. All right, so Socrates is essentially saying the same thing I just was, right? We can have things hidden away in our mind, bits of knowledge, that we don't really know how to access immediately, either because we haven't thought about it in a while or it's somehow connected to our immortal soul and we have to bring it to the forefront. Okay, but Socrates is obviously claiming more than I was, right? I was just saying, yeah, sometimes it's hard for me to remember stuff. Socrates isn't saying, no, I can't remember. Socrates is saying, no, that information is somehow like hidden in my soul and I need to pull it forward. So he's going to need to give some evidence for this. 
And so in the Mino, Socrates calls over one of Mino's slaves, uh, and he's going to prove that we can recollect knowledge by talking to this slave, right? So in order to prove that recollection of knowledge is possible, Socrates questions one of Mino's slaves, and he gets the slave to identify solutions to geometry problems. And so when the slave succeeds at answering these geometry problems, even though the slave has had no education in geometry, Socrates concludes that he must be right, that the slave already had innate knowledge about geometry before he was embodied. Otherwise, how could the slave possibly know the answers to these questions? And so let's look at this in a little more detail. And so here's the interaction. So after this, this discussion here comes after the slave gives the correct answer to the geometry problem. So this is Socrates' conclusion from his interaction with the slave. Socrates. Well, now these opinions have newly aroused in this boy as if in a dream. But if someone asks him these same things many times and in many ways, you can be sure that in the end he will come to have exact knowledge of these things as well as anyone else does. Mino agrees. So then he will have knowledge without having been taught by anyone, but only having been asked questions and having recovered this knowledge from himself. Mino agrees. And is this not just simply recovering knowledge oneself in oneself? Recollecting? Certainly. Then did not this boy either acquire at some time the knowledge which he ha now has, or else always possess it. Yes. Well, if he always possessed it, he was always knowledgeable. And if he acquired it at some time, at any rate, he will not have acquired it in this present life. Or has anyone taught this boy geometry? For he will do the same where every part of geometry is concerned, and all other subjects too. Is there anyone then, uh, is there there anyone who taught this boy everything? You ought to know, I suppose, especially as he was born and brought up in your household. Mino says, no, I do indeed know that no one ever taught him. Okay, so Socrates is saying here, look, he gave me the correct answers to these, uh, not difficult, but correct answers to these, um, geometry problems, geometry problems that there's no way somebody who wasn't educated in geometry should be able to give these answers. And so if he didn't get that education in this life, then if he has that knowledge, it had to come from before this life. And so he either always had it or he acquired it at some time before he was in this body. Either way, that means he has a soul. And that soul can recollect things. And so here's the summary if uh, you do better with reading than hearing. All right, so if the slave never received any training in geometry, then the best explanation for the slave having this knowledge is that he already possessed this knowledge. The knowledge was innate within him, and all he needed to do is recollect that knowledge. So the knowledge must have come from, bef from before his embodiment when his soul was in the realm of the forms. So this is an argument to the best explanation, right? Socrates says, look at this miraculous thing that just happened. This slave with no education in geometry just answered a bunch of geometry problems all by his own. Right? I just gave him the questions. He gave me the answers. The best explanation for this miraculous occurrence is that the slave already had innate knowledge of geometry. And that innate knowledge had to have come from before he was in his present body. So here we have an argument for the forms and the uh, soul that says the best explanation for the slave's uh, solutions here is that the soul exists and it was accessing something like the form. Somehow it was getting knowledge. But there's an important question here, right? If we already have knowledge of the forms, right? If the soul has already seen all this stuff and this knowledge is simply innate within us, then why do we need to go through this process, right? Why do we have to search and struggle 
to pull this information back to the surface? Why is recollection such a long process, right? Socrates has been questioning people his entire life and still can't recollect the truths about justice and piety and goodness, so on and so forth. But that's hard to swallow, right? Because if all of that knowledge is already there within you, why is it so hard to access? Why can't you just pull it out immediately? Here, the answer that Plato gives is that embodiment is what does it to you, right? So when your soul's up in the immaterial realm, it's basically sitting there, looking at all the forms, contemplating it, seeing the relations between all things, and then it gets dragged down into the physical world, and boom, embodiment occurs. Now, all of a sudden, the soul is getting flooded, right? Flooded with beliefs that come primarily from the flaws and desires of the body. So, boom, you're in your body. Your body starts going, I desire food. I believe I need food. I believe I need sex and sleep and water, so on and so forth, right? I desire pleasure. And it's just getting flooded with all these things from the body. And not only all of those desires the body has, but also beliefs about the things you're sensing, right? So you see things out in the world. You see the shadows on the wall. You see the objects, so on and so forth. And you get all of these beliefs about those imperfect objects. And you also get a bunch of false beliefs that are just given to you by the social environment or tradition that you're raised in, right? So your body is just getting inundated with false beliefs that come from the sense experiences of your body, the desires of your body, and the social environment you're raised in. And so your soul, with its perfect knowledge, uh, it sort of gets covered up, right? So you had all those true beliefs there, but then it gets flooded, covered up with all these false beliefs, and now it's really hard for you to know what the truth is, because you have this mixture of thousands and thousands of false beliefs on top of your true beliefs. So that's why we have to go through the process of recollection and dialectic. Right? We have to pull that stuff out because we have to uncover it from all the crap that's just been put on top of it. And one way I like to think about this is with like a painting restoration. Right. So imagine uh, this whole process is like paint restoration. So here is your soul right after embodiment, right? Your soul comes down, gets inundated uh, with all the false beliefs. It's like throwing mud and stuff on top of a painting, right? And so through the arts of dialectic and education, uh, as you start going through Socrates' process and learning uh, what false beliefs to get rid of, you're clearing away the mud. You're restoring your painting. And if you had enough time, right? If you had enough time and effort, you could eventually restore it to perfect condition. So embodiment's going to flood you with false beliefs that obscure your perfect painting or innate knowledge, and then your job is to restore it, You're, right? Your job is to recollect all of this stuff. It's to pull it back to the surface by eliminating all of those false beliefs through the art of dialectic. So... This is why the art of dialectic is so important. So this is what really justifies the process Socrates was exercising, right? The art of dialectic we saw in the Euthyphro plays this widely value, I mean, greatly valuable role in leading us to the good life, right? So it can lead us to that innate knowledge we have always had by helping us eliminate the false beliefs we've acquired since embodiment by revealing inconsistencies in our thinking. And so what's the idea here? Well, if you always have the truth, right? The truth is innate in you, so you always have it. Then all of the false beliefs that come in from the world are going to be inconsistent with at least some of the truths that are innate within you. So if you were given enough time and control over your body, then you could see all of the inconsistencies and eventually eliminate all of your false beliefs. And then you would restore your soul to its unconfused state. You would only be left with all of your perfect knowledge of the forms, your innate knowledge. So dialectic is really the art of getting back to the perfect state of your soul. It shows you the inconsistency so you can eliminate it and get back to your perfect knowledge. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll move on to the Phaedo and see if Socrates can justify a belief in the immortal soul instead of just uh, a soul that existed that we can recollect from. Thank you.